King's Cross Sydney in the 1980s was a mix of culture and entertainment, considered a tourist mecca as thousands would flock to its neon-lit streets every day. It was also known to many as a haven of Sydney's criminal underworld. Shops, restaurants, nightclubs, brothels and illegal casinos. There was something there for everyone, and corrupt police were no different. One day in 1984, decorated New South Wales detective Roger Rogerson was being closely investigated by his own police force. From high up on a rooftop in the suburb of Waterloo, the police were hoping to snap a picture of the detective and his associate. He was at the Iron Duke Hotel, meeting with big-time Sydney crook, Arthur Neddy Smith. Roger Caleb Rogerson was born in Sydney on the 3rd of January 1941. One of three children, he grew up in the suburb of Bankstown, Sydney. After attending Homebush Boys High School, Rogerson entered the police force in New South Wales Police Cadet Service in 1958. Showing promise early on in his career, Rogerson quickly rose through the ranks to become a detective and was involved in numerous high-profile cases of the late 60s and early 70s, such as the Toe Cutter gang murder and the Whiskey A Go Go nightclub bombing in Queensland, the latter of which he and another Sydney detective were called in for investigation due to suspected connection with Sydney criminals. Becoming a part of the Special Weapons and Operations Squad, Rogerson was regularly called upon to take part in the arrest of dangerous offenders in the 1970s. Rogerson became so prolific in his job that his name was known by police branches all over Australia, particularly along the East Coast. In June of 1976, he was with a SWAS team that surrounded the Avica Beach on the central coast to apprehend Philip Weston, a bank robber and jail escapee. When Weston tried to flee, the SWAS opened fire and killed him. Rogerson later stated that his team, quote, blew his head off. However, his colleagues' memories of this differ somewhat. Such was his reputation, Rogerson could gain convictions based on the strength of unsigned records of interviews with prisoners, known as police verbals. Not only that, but he was also asked to investigate the infamous Ananda Marga conspiracy case, which involved a spiritual New Age group and a Sydney Hilton hotel bombing that occurred on the 13th of February 1978, when a bomb exploded outside the Hilton Hotel in George Street, Sydney. This was despite Rogerson having no association with the special branch investigating the crime. In 1980, Rogerson was awarded the prestigious Peter Mitchell Award for the arrest of escaped armed robber Gary Purdy. A decorated detective, respected in his community and in his job, a member of the revered Armed Hold-Up Squad, and an upcoming glowing six-page recommendation for a rank promotion to sergeant. He was even referred to as, quote, the greatest copper ever and hero. Everything seemed to be coming up Rogerson. Simultaneously, while Rogerson was rising through the ranks, corruption within politics and police in New South Wales was reaching an all-time high. Rogerson was about to go from revered to reviled. By the early 1980s, rumours had begun swirling around Rogerson's alleged connections to Sydney's criminal underworld. He was perhaps just another product of his time. Inside the police branches of New South Wales, officers far more senior than Rogerson would face accusations of corruption and misconduct, including a string of three police commissioners in the 1970s. According to an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, Deputy Commissioner Bill Allen was forced to resign in 1982 after taking an overseas holiday partly paid for by gambling figures and meeting regularly with the state's most notorious gangster, Abe Saffron, alone in his office on six different occasions. King's Cross was ruled not by the gangsters, but by the crooked cops who ran rackets on the dozen or so outlets that were allowed to sell drugs on the street without police interference. Bending the lines of the police moral code was a sure bet to fast-track your career in the force. The corruption had spread into the police's internal affairs branch, which was there to protect the force's integrity, and even their promotion system had been rigged by corrupt senior-ranking police. It was understood by those in Sydney's police force if you saw it, you dare not speak it, a so-called blue coat of silence. Honest cops were ultimately persecuted by the corrupt inner circle, 
and even feared for their lives. However, that blue coat of silence was about to come screaming into the wider world, opening up a wave of allegations and accusations and prompting the government to form royal inquests into the widespread corruption. The downfall of Rogerson began in 1976, when he was involved in the arrest of Bobby Chapman and Arthur Stanley Nettie Smith. This would start a long-term relationship between Rogerson and Smith, whom the latter claimed would regularly take bribes in return for a license to commit crimes. Smith was well known in the late 1970s to be dealing large amounts of heroin. Although it would be years later when the mainstream media caught wind of this, it was through Nettie Smith's connection to Warren Lanfranchi that Rogerson's squeaky clean image came undone. 23-year-old Warren Lanfranchi was a known drug dealer working for Nettie Smith. Lanfranchi was not long out of jail for a string of other offences, including the Intepton murder of a motorcycle cop and a murder of a small-time drug dealer in Wollongong, who was alleged to be in police protection. It was in June of 1981 when Rogerson organised a meeting with Warren Lanfranchi through mutual contact Smith under the pretense of paying a $10,000 bribe to the detective and they met in Sydney's Chippendale. Lanfranchi was then shot dead by Rogerson. Minutes after the killing, Rogerson gave an interview to a news reporter and was briefly hailed as a hero who was keeping the mean streets of Sydney clean. This all came crashing down when the partner of Lanfranchi, sex worker Sally Ann Huckstep, took to the media and made serious allegations that Lanfranchi was not armed and was in fact murdered in cold blood. A sentiment that was also shared by Lanfranchi's father and Huckstep's friend, Lynn Woodward. Detective Rogerson from the Armed Hold-Up Squad. Detective Rogerson has a reputation as being a very evil man. Had Warren had dealings with Detective Rogerson before? Not as far as I know, no. Well, he knew Sergeant Rogerson was uh, involved in armed robberies, that he supplied heroin to Parramatta Jail. He supplied heroin to Parramatta Jail? That's right. The man he's ripped off is this policeman, and he's frightened. Warren thought that Detective Rogerson was going to kill him. Why did he think that? Because $37,000 is a lot of money. Demanding an investigation into Lanfranchi's death, Huckstep also made statements to the New South Wales Police Internal Affairs Branch. During a coronial inquest, Rogerson maintained that he was acting in self-defence. Quote, I regret it. Of course I do. I believe I acted in good faith, and that if I had not shot him, he would have shot me. End quote. The inquest cleared him of any wrongdoing, and that while he had not shot in self-defence, he had done so while trying to make an arrest. Huckstep's friend, Lynn Woodward, supposedly had evidence Lanfranchi had gone to the meeting unarmed, but she disappeared hours after making her first appearance at the inquest and was never seen again. Huckstep followed a similar fate, and years later, her body was found in Centennial Park. If Huckstep's whistleblowing started the fire, then it was fellow detective Michael Jury's incident that added fuel to the blaze. In June of 1984, New South Wales Drug Squad detective Michael Jury was shot through his kitchen window at home whilst feeding his young daughter. Prior to this, Jury had infiltrated a heroin drug ring in Melbourne through Sydney-based dealers Jack Richardson and Frank Avery, who led him to major Southern player Alan Williams. Jury maintained that Detective Rogerson had attempted to bribe him to tamper with the evidence against Williams. Many in the New South Wales Police Force chose not to believe it, while others firmly stood by their fellow colleague. An investigation into the allegations quickly followed. Rogerson was charged with bribery and attempted murder, and Alan Williams testified that he paid $50,000 each to Rogerson and well-known hitman Christopher Dale Flannery to murder Detective Jury. The courts, however, ruled in Rogerson's favour, and he was eventually acquitted. However, the trial and accusations did more harm to his reputation than good. In November of 1984, Rogerson was suspended from active service in the New South Wales Police, and in 1986, he was dismissed outright from the force. From this day forward, his name was synonymous in the headlines with words like corrupt and disgraced detective. After leaving the force, Rogerson worked in the building and construction industry as a supplier of scaffolding. 
It wasn't until 1990 that Rogerson was sent to prison after being found guilty of perverting the court of justice after being found with several bank accounts in false names with an excess of $110,000. Rogerson spent three years in Berrimah prison and was an inmate with a former commissioner who had previously been found guilty of corruption. Around this time, an investigation was launched into police corruption in New South Wales. And during this, a former associate of Rogerson, Nettie Smith, had confessed that he had been paying bribes to the New South Wales detective for years, and this would give him the green light to commit any crimes in Sydney as long as it wasn't murder. Smith was also in prison in 1989 and would remain there until his death. Smith's allegations fueled conspiracies about Rogerson being a suspect in the murders of Sally Ann Huckstep, her friend Lynn Woodward, and well-known hitman Chris Flannery, who had gone missing in 1985. After release from prison, Rogerson became an entertainer speaking on stage with Mark Jacko Jackson and Chopper Reed in a spoken word comedy show called The Wild Colonial Psychos. However, more drama would follow Rogerson and his wife as they were both convicted of lying to the 1999 Police Integrity Commission. Rogerson then spent a further two and a half years in prison. Never far from the headlines, it wasn't until 2014 that Roger Rogerson would completely destroy any upstanding reputation he had left. In May of 2014, Rogerson and former colleague Glenn McNamara were filmed on CCTV entering a storage facility with student Jamie Gow with the pretense of a drug deal. Three men entered and two men left. The former detective stole the drugs and shot 20-year-old Jamie Gow. On the 6th of March, 2015, both accused were arraigned at a hearing in the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Both pleaded not guilty to the murder of Gow. The men were due for trial in the Supreme Court on February 1st, 2016. And on the 2nd of September, 2016, Justice Jeffrey Bellew sentenced Rogerson and McNamara to life in prison with the statement, quote, The joint criminal enterprise to which each offender was a party was extensive in its planning, brutal in its execution, and callous in its aftermath, end quote. Lawyers for both Rogerson and McNamara indicated they would appeal against the sentence. However, neither Rogerson nor McNamara formally lodged appeals. In July 2019, Rogerson's last application for an extension of time to do so was refused by the New South Wales Supreme Court. On January the 21st, 2024, disgraced detective and Australia's most corrupt cop died at the age of 83 at the Prince of Wales Hospital. There's an old saying that comes to mind when thinking about Roger Rogerson and his acts of murder and corruption. One rotten apple can spoil the whole bunch. I get a lot of comments on here about how greedy the government is or how corrupt and crooked the cops are in whatever part of the world you live in. But I think it would be unfair to tar everyone with the same brush, especially when we know of and have heard examples of police in our communities who really did the right thing. They stood up to bullies within their own workforce and spoke out against corruption, sometimes at great personal risk. One impact that Rogerson's actions had was how it changed policing in not only New South Wales, but in other parts of the country too. Due to the Wood Royal Commission, the way police gained statements or confessions has changed. The practice of recording interviews made it harder for police to quote verbal criminals with false confessions. Furthermore, the commission removed the idea that police alone were required to secure convictions. According to another article in the Sydney Morning Herald, a commission spokesperson said, Quote, we went from having a corruption-prone to a corruption-resistant police force, end quote. Further statements were added by New South Wales police spokespeople, and they stated that the entire recruitment process has changed. Not only that, but they had new technologies and resources that weren't available back in the 70s and 80s. Junior recruits were more eager to whistleblow and call out the bad behaviour, something they lacked sorely in the past. But what are your thoughts on Roger Rogerson Australia's most corrupt cop? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more content like this and click that notifications bell to keep up to date with the latest videos. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter.